This first one is from June 5th, 2009. I can't decide if this is a daily email about my sex life or a daily email about an online culture magazine called The Rumpus. Let's go with sex life. Last night, I did a reading at the Center for Sex and Culture, Army of Lovers, an event featuring readings and performances from current or former male sex workers. That sounds like it would be a really bad event, but actually it was a really good event. Well, curated, and, and the performances were fantastic. I was with a woman who I think I'm in love with, who will only have sex with me while her ex-boyfriend is taking pictures. And then in parentheses it says, pictures are for sale, by the way. <laughs> and then in parentheses it says, I'm serious about this. And then in parentheses it says, I use the term sex here very loosely. <laughs> At one point during the intermission, she asked if it was weird for me that she has a boyfriend. I said, no, that part isn't weird. Then she asked if it was strange that we were doing all these photo shoots as an excuse to sleep together because she was in a monogamous relationship. Yes, I said, that part is strange. Really, you think it's weird? Yes, I said, I do. Back in the theater, I wrote in my notebook a reminder to look up a quote from George Orwell. Doublethink means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one mi one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. I don't know what made me think of that. I kissed her shoulder and pretended it didn't matter. All right, so this next one, is, uh, oh, yeah, okay. this next one here. Okay, so this is uh, this is pretty much a little over a year later, which is I mean, these were really printed up at random. It wasn't like I was thinking, oh, just print the ones about that particular woman. It was just kind of like downloaded a bunch of them and printed them up. So this is July twelfth, two thousand ten. Also, I should say that the reason I write so much about sex workers and sex workers is because I was a sex worker, <laughs> not because I fetishize uh, <laughs> sex workers. Maybe I do, but it's all, you know, but it's not without being one myself, I'm saying, something like that. Uh, I wanted, yeah, at this point I was with the Desiree Sex Workers Alliance in uh, Las Vegas. On Saturday, I was talking with a sex worker about that boundary you cross. She was saying that she thought she would move on from certain things, but hadn't. We agreed that exchanging your body for cash was not something you could undo, and also that the people who are important in your life are often not the people who you think are important in your life at the time. Later, someone told me the universe would provide. You just had to really want something. We were talking about money, but the point I was trying to make was that you could make do with less. Also. I don't like people who think they can have it all. I believe in prioritizing. She said you could make art and money, and I kind of shook my head, and I kind of changed the subject. That night, I gave a reading from text messages. A woman had asked me over text why I didn't want to be her slave. I said it was too much work. <laughs> I explained I'd been fired 12 times. She wondered if it was possible to have a lifelong slave. I said I thought it would be difficult, but maybe if there were some parameters, like maybe if he was only your slave on Wednesday. The thing about the girl sending me text messages was that I thought maybe I loved her, but it really depended on your definition of love. It's possible I was confusing love with desire, but it's also possible everybody else was confusing love with something else. That love and desire were more closely connected than we cared to admit, at least at the beginning. She said, what I really wanted was just a kinky girlfriend, but if she was my girlfriend, she would drive me crazy because she was high maintenance. I agreed with her. My last serious girlfriend had a slave, a guy that would go with us when we went dancing and watch our coats. He cleaned her house, which she shared with her husband once a week. She'd been with her, she'd, she'd been with her slave a long time. She was 18 and he was 16 when she took his virginity. Eventually she left her husband and then we broke up as well. Then her and her slave move in, moved in together. One time between, you know, you're signing up for this email. You're saying, <laughs> you know, see you're getting links, you know, to like interesting articles. I mean, what the fuck is this, you know? Uh, anyway, one time between breakups, we drove three hours north to Mendocino and stayed in a hotel overlooking the bay. 
In the morning, we'd walk around the small town. At some point, we'd picnic near the water. When it was raining hard, we parked in front of the ocean and ate in the car. At night, we watched movies. We stayed four days. When I look back on that relationship, none of it makes sense. I wonder if we tried again, if we could do better. Um, okay, so this is the, the third in the trilogy. Uh, this is later still. Uh, okay, this is, this is from the Sex Workers Convention. This is July 28, 2010. I'm trying to write about this woman I love, but maybe too much has been written about her, the way too much has been written about Las Vegas. Last night, we were eating dinner. She was wearing jeans, and I had my hand on the inside of her thigh, and she asked how long I was going to wait. I don't think I answered. I know better than to take the bait. Later, I mentioned I had written something about her. I didn't mention that it was coming out in an anthology. <laughs> she asked me to read it at the performance later. In the essay, I talk about rejection as foreplay. I say, I love her, but I don't like her. A few hours before the reading, I taught a writing class, the reason they brought me out here. Before that, I stood in the pool with a performance artist, our arms raised above our heads, talking about a child. The stage is always glamorous. It's why students fall in love with teachers. But the paint starts to peel the moment the performance is over, and you go back to being like everybody else, or worse. At the end of the night, I was outside the casino in the dark. It was still hot and dry, only a shade more bearable than the daytime. I thought about Eli, who has a theory. His theory is that with most people, when you meet them, they seem well put together. And as you get to know them, you find that they're actually all kinds of screwed up. And as you get to know them more, you find that underneath that is a third layer of bedrock, where they're actually pretty solid. He once told me that I was the reverse. That at first I seemed like a mess, but as he got to know me, I seemed really solid. But beneath that, I was truly a mess. <laughs> I had a foundation in sand. Who's to say? The point is, she asked how long I would wait. And at night, I started to think how easy it was to love her. It was perfectly safe, like loving a streetcar you saw pass by once. She said, you're never going to quit, are you? And I thought, there is no end game here. <laughs> 